Um, so hopefully none of this will be news to the people who work in the family law practice group or it'll reaffirm what you already know. But really the goal of this presentation is that you will all see clients in your respective areas of law and hopefully um, this will be a good issue spotting training for you. And when you see somebody who has one of the issues that we talk about, you will refer to the Children and Family Law Practice Group. My name is Jennifer Payne. I'm the point person of the Children and Family Law Practice Group. So uh, feel free to call me if you think that something might be an appropriate intra-agency referral. Uh, when we talk about domestic violence, we primarily talk about these statutes. So these are the common areas of law. Uh, there are three types of protective orders in the state of Illinois. The Illinois Domestic Violence Act is the oldest of the three statutes. It is what enables a person to actually walk into court and obtain an order of protection against another person with whom they're in a domestic relationship with. So 90% of our cases will be filed under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. That's the statute that we primarily deal with. At the end of my presentation, I'll talk about stalking no contact orders and civil no contact orders. Those are other types of orders of protection that are against non-domestic partners, which I'll explain. The only thing you need to know about the Illinois Address Confidentiality Act is that it is what it says. If you are the victim of abuse, you have the right to keep your address confidential when you seek an order of protection under any of these three statutes. So if you're the victim of abuse, you do not have to close your residential address. You have to disclose an address for purposes of receiving notice, right? You, you want to get notice in a case, you have, to you have to put down an address, but it does not have to be your residential address. All of the courthouses have domestic violence advocates, and they allow their address to be used for petitioners that they help, okay? And it certainly, if you have an attorney, it would be your attorney's address. I will talk a little bit about jurisdiction, but, um, but we'll go over it briefly, um, and I uh, will not bore you with the details of the UCCJEA, um, although Benna might want to do that <laughs> the other day. Yes. <laughs> Benna actually gave like a two-hour presentation just on that statute. So um, orders of protection. A civil order of protection is issued when a victim proves that she needs some, uh, a domestic partner to stop abusing her. But abuse is a term of art. It's defined by the statute. Okay, so we're going to go through a little bit about what does it mean to be abused. Um, there is no prerequis prerequisite to getting an order of protection other than being abused by a domestic partner. So you don't have to have called the police. You don't have to have a police report. You don't have to have medical records confirming abuse. You can just walk into court and testify. All right. It is a civil proceeding. Your burden of proof is a preponderance of the evidence. So you can walk into court and you can testify and convince a judge by a preponderance of the evidence that you were abused. So what is abuse? As I said, it's a term of art. It's defined by the statute. Abuse includes physical abuse. So it includes being um, hit, slapped, kicked. It includes being forced to have sex when you don't want to or in a way that you don't want to. It includes sleep deprivation. So we had a case last week. She was routinely woken up six, seven, eight times in the middle of the night by her husband who would come home extremely drunk. And as a result, her work suffered, right? She, she got to work. She was totally exhausted. This was happening night after night after night. And her employer, uh, with no surprise, said, we don't think that you're a very productive person. We don't think you have good time management skills. We're going to let you go. So being extremely sleep deprived is not just a form of abuse, but it really impacts our clients in very real ways. Um, reckless conduct, which creates an immediate risk of harm. Does anybody know, um, outside of the family law group, an example of what that would be? Reckless conduct, which creates an immediate risk of harm. So you're not actually harmed. But it's an immediate risk of harm. Can anybody think of an example of that? Assault. Pardon me? I said it sounds like assault. So assault, actually hitting somebody. So that would be an example of an actual harm. But reckless conduct, for the most part, we see sometimes um, people who are in the passenger seat of a car, they go to get out, and the driver slams on the accelerator, and so they're hanging on to the door. Let's say you're hanging onto the door for a block and you're frightened out of your mind. In the end, you're not harmed, 
right? You get out of the car safely, but the conduct was so reckless, right, that it created an immediate risk of harm. So that is included in the definition of abuse under the IDVA, the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. Abuse also includes harassment, and I'm going to get to the definition of that, and it includes interference with personal liberty. Do, does anybody know what that is? Interference with your personal liberty? Like uh, false imprisonment? Okay. False imprisonment, like? Give me an example. Uh, I guess the spouse um, locks you in your room and says, the sort of the tort standard, right? Aha! Uh -huh. See, this person is <laughs> very clever of you. Right, someone locks you into a room, locks you into the bathroom. You have a deadbolt on your house. They lock you into the house. They take your car keys so you can't get to work, right? Your personal liberty is um, infringed upon. Uh, we see that a lot. We see the, the, the stealing of the car keys is very, very common thing. But sometimes we see uh, locking in a bathroom, locked in a closet, locked in a house. Um, so that's interference with your personal liberty. Intimidation of a dependent, but not reasonable direction. So to be clear, um, corporal punishment is not illegal in Illinois. If people choose to use corporal punishment to discipline their kids, that is perfectly legal. It becomes illegal when you are hitting your kids to the point of leaving cuts, welts, and bruises. I am in no way advocating corporal punishment. That is not my intent, but my intent is to be very, very clear that sometimes we see people you know, who will who will confuse corporal punishment with abuse. It has to leave cuts, welts, and bruises or something to that degree to be considered illegal or to be considered abuse. But if your child runs out into the middle of the street and the parent feels that spanking the child is an appropriate form of punishment, the parent has a right to do that and you're not going to get an order of protection against the parent for doing that. Okay, So um, we have to be careful with our clients and what they do and don't consider abuse. The statute also allows for an order of protection when you're harassed. So we see many cases where there is no physical abuse, but the client is harassed to the point of being entitled to an order of protection. And if you're going to get an order of protection under the definition of harassment, you have to meet all three of these elements. So if you only have one or two of these elements, you're not going to make it. You have to meet all three. The conduct is unreasonable under the circumstances his conduct, the respondent's conduct. So I'm just going to use the terms uh, he for the respondent, she for the petitioner, because that's the majority of our cases. His conduct needs to be unreasonable under the circumstances. And his conduct would cause a reasonable person emotional distress and does cause her emotional distress. So I had a case a few months ago where he sent 572 text messages to my client in a three-month period. In the same three-month period, she sent him three text messages, all three of which said, please stop contacting me. Okay? He never hit her. He never physically abused her. But sending somebody 572 text messages with only three responses, guys, okay, <laughs> might be a form of harassment, and it might cause a reasonable person emotional distress, so don't do that. If you have done that, don't do that. Um, and in fact, in my client's case, it did cause her emotional distress. So that would be an example of harassment where you are entitled to an order of protection. The statute also gives out specific examples of harassment. So if we have um, a client who is complaining about any of these particular forms of harassment, um, that's a particularly good case because the statute identifies that as an example of harassment. Disturbing you at your place of work, right? If, <coughs> if your um, partner or spouse were to walk into LAF and cause a scene in the waiting room and start screaming and demanding to see you, you'd be horrified. You'd be completely embarrassed. Everybody would be talking about you, right? You'd get pulled into Ruby's office. What is going on? It's humiliating. So that's a form of harassment. Um, repeated text and phone calls, so um, that would be like the 572 text messages. Repeatedly following you in public, right? It's creepy. You walk out your house, there's somebody following you, there's somebody looking at you out the window, there's guys in bushes, <laughs> you know, just a lot of 
uh, weird uh, following people in public. Don't do that. If you have done that, maybe you should stop doing that because it's creepy and you could have an order of protection against you. But also if a client calls and says that she thinks that pe there are people in bushes following her, you might want to have like a second person verify that. So, um, <laughs> yes. Um, Teresa's raising the point that, you know, sometimes we do get people who might suffer from delusion or paranoia, but, but we all have that, right? All of us might have a client who has a mental health issue, and what they're presenting to us may or may not be, uh, may or may not comport with reality. But we do have clients who, um, who have uh, the respondent is, in fact, hiding in the bushes, and there are plenty of witnesses to that. Or he's driving slowly by their house and just peering at her or peeking into her windows. I mean, can you imagine getting dressed in your bedroom and seeing like somebody's face peeking into the windows? Like, that's pretty creepy. So uh, don't do that, okay? <laughs> Those of you who are doing that. Um, repeatedly threatening physical force. So sometimes people will form a fist. They'll have a fist, and they'll kind of go to punch you so that you flinch. Um, but they don't really punch you, right? But that's okay. That's a form of harassment. That would cause a reasonable person emotional distress, and that's unreasonable behavior. So those are all the forms of abuse and harassment. You have to prove by preponderance of the evidence that, that you were abused or harassed. And the person who is doing the abuse and harassment has to be a domestic partner of some sort, like your spouse, ex-spouse, <coughs> parents, children, stepchildren. It has to be one of these relationships. These are domestic relationships. A family or household member, the Illinois Domestic Violence Act, is to protect individuals from being abused by family and household members. Okay? I have a question. How far back does the form of dating relationship <laughs> Rich, it's funny that you should ask that. So, two Thursdays ago, the Illinois Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, said that there um, does not have to be a date on how far back the former dating relationship could go. That if you broke up with somebody 15 years ago or 20 years ago and they are still harassing you as a result of that intimate relationship, that's a prior dating relationship as defined by the Act. So, um, yeah, so LAF, we, uh, we joined with the Dentons filing an amicus brief in that case, so we're happy about um, the fact that the constitutionality of that provision was upheld. Is there a standard for determining whether the relationship exists? Like if it's a house, if it's someone that's like staying over and they've been staying for a month, like a friend, is that a roommate? Well, I mean, if the person is actually living there, right. that's going to be counted. Okay. We don't get too many cases where um, there's a dispute over whether or not it's a domestic because, in fact, the only, the only times I've been in a case where there was a dispute over whether it was domestic was the respondent feeling that they had a dating relationship and the petitioner, our client, saying, he was not my boyfriend or I, I did not consider myself dating him, right? So if anything, he might be the person who is embellishing the relationship. But um, I haven't had a case where a roommate says, I don't live there, she's crazy. I, you know, So the domestic relationship is often not disputed. It could be, but that's not typically where we see the, um, the dispute effect. OK, all household members are protected. So why is this important? Dana? Um, quick question. Is there a benefit to identifying someone as a uh, family or household relationship versus just getting like a stalking no contact order? You, you are not eligible to get a stalking no contact order if you are in a domestic mm -hmm. relationship with somebody. Mm -hmm. That statute actually prohibits you from getting it. So what, is there a benefit to getting an OP over a stalking no contact order, or is it the same? There are more remedies. Okay. Um, the question is, is there any benefit to getting an order of protection under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act? Um, they have the same <coughs> enforceability when it comes to the police enforcing it. Um, I think the only benefit would be that there are more remedies available to you under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act, and there are very few remedies under the Stalking No Contact Order Act. Okay. But if it's a domestic relationship, you have to go under the IDVA. Okay. okay. So household members, why is this important? Everybody who lives in your household can be a protected person on the order. And where I think this becomes most important is the 18-year-old or the 19-year-old who's in an abusive dating relationship, she lives with her parents, and 18 or 19 year old gets an order of protection. She includes her mom, her household members. And then three months later, a boyfriend comes back and he's banging on the windows and he's you know, throwing rocks and he's doing all kinds of stuff. And client, maybe the 18 or 19 year old, doesn't want to call the police. 
Maybe she's back in a relationship with her boyfriend. But mom is a protected person on the order of protection, and mom can say, I'm calling the police. I want him off of my property. I want him arrested. So if you're a protected person on the order of protection, you can enforce it. You, it's a crime if they violate the order. You can call the police. You can file a report. So protected people is actually important. Who is not protected? If you get into a dispute with your neighbor, you're not going to get an order of protection under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. That is not a domestic relationship. Or your landlord, coworkers, strangers. In this case, this is a love triangle. She used to date him. Okay, she currently dates him. So she could get an order of protection against him if he's abusive, and she could get an order of protection against him, current boyfriend, if he's abusive. But if these two people see each other in a bar and get into a fight, they're not going to get an order of protection against each other under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. They can call the police, right? It might be a crime, it might be an assault, it might be a battery, but it's not going to be an order of protection under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. If there's a pervasive pattern of him showing up at this guy's work, Yeah, so if, if um, past boyfriend stalks current boyfriend, he can get a stalking no contact order because that doesn't have to be domestic. So what remedies can I get? I've now proved what abuse and harassment is. I now know that it's a domestic relationship. What can I get? I can get an order that says he can't abuse me, harass me. He can't interfere with my personal liberty, intimidate my kids. Um, and he can also get, um, he has to stay away from me prohibit from going into um, the residence while he's drunk or high. But the most important remedy on this page that I want you to be aware of is exclusive possession of the home. If you have a client who's living in an abusive relationship and the person who's abusing her lives in her home with her, one of the remedies that we can get in an order of protection is for him to be evicted from the home for her to get exclusive possession of the home. This is an extraordinary remedy. This is an incredibly important remedy for our clients. If she's the mom of three kids, and the kids all go to school in the neighborhood, and all their friends are in the neighborhood, and all their activities are in the neighborhood, where is she going to go? If she doesn't have the financial means to leave and rent her own place, she might not have anywhere to go. So exclusive possession of the home is a very important remedy under the Illinois Domestic Violence Act. There are also child-related remedies other than that. Physical care of your child, temporary custody, we can get visitation schedules, we can request uh, child support. Um, this prohibition of access to records really has to do with maybe, maybe she wants to keep her address confidential and she knows he's going to come to the school and look at school records to see the address. She knows he's going to go to the doctor to look at the medical records to see the address. He's never been to a doctor's appointment in his life for the kids. Suddenly he's calling the doctor, right? He's never been to a parent-teacher conference in his life. Suddenly he's at the school. So that's when we would use that remedy. Um, and then there's other things, exclusive possession of personal property. What is the number one um, article of personal property that we try to get for our clients in an order of protection? Yeah, so you guys are smart. Okay. Yeah, the car, the car. So disappointed. <laughs> I am very disappointed. I thought I would stump you. Okay. Um, yeah, the car is often a big deal, right? She's got to get to work. She's got the kids. She's got to get them to school. Exclusive possession of animals. Uh, Catherine Huber last week did get an order of protection that included Toby, the Maltese dog, is a protected. Yes, he's adorable. And I once got an OP that included Whiskers the cat. So it doesn't happen that often when you're dealing with low-income uh, clients, but it can happen. Reimbursement of financial loss. Which the, what is the number one financial loss that I have had to seek reimbursement of on behalf of my client? Missing work. No, but missing work Slash is good. Tires. Slash tires. Yeah, the tires are always slashed. Yes. <laughs> And he doesn't know how they got slashed, just so you know. It's a mystery. It's always a mystery. How do the tires get slashed? So um, if you have a client who has out-of-pocket expenses, missed work could be one, or medical, make sure she saves the receipts. So now we know um, what abuse and harassment is, who we can get the OP against. We know what remedies can we get. Uh, now where do we go? There are lots of places you can go to get an order of protection. Sometimes you have to figure out, am I even in the right state? 
So one thing to be mindful of if you're from another practice group is that really other practice groups um, seldom, seldom have to deal with these type of jurisdictional issues. If you're doing housing, right, and the person lives here and they're being evicted from an apartment in Cook County, of course the case is going to be in Illinois. Of course it's going to be in Cook County. Jurisdiction is really never an issue. You know, same with public benefits. It's really just not an issue. But when you're dealing with people who are in violent relationships, they are often fleeing the abuse, right? They're married in California. The kids are abused in California. She's abused in California. And she comes to Illinois to be with her parents. Where is she going to live? Where is she going to go? So there is often crossing of state lines, often crossing of state lines. And we sometimes have to decide, is this even the right state? Should you be filing the order of protection here? So it's just something to be mindful of and also to be mindful that jurisdiction of the child is a completely separate analysis than jurisdiction of the respondent. Do you have a question? Do you, for your guys, if you have a case, do you ever file in other jurisdictions, like other states for the client? Well, we would not personally file, but we would call the legal services office in that state or in that county and say, we think that we don't have jurisdiction but we find this client credible, we're asking you to take the case. So um, Benna did not, in fact, fly to Washington State in her recent case, but we got attorneys in Washington to handle the Washington part of it, and we handled the Illinois part of it. Um, so getting back to children, I just want you to be aware that jurisdiction of children is a completely separate analysis than jurisdiction of a respondent in an order of protection, and there is something called a six-month look-back rule what is the child's home state? Where has the child lived for the past six months? If you have a case that you're referring to us that includes children, all I ask is that you ask these three questions. Where do the children currently reside? How long have they been in this state or that state, wherever they reside? And is there already a court order in existence about their custody or their parentage, right? We really have to know the answer to those three questions before we um, form any sort of an opinion about where the case regarding the children should be filed. And then, what venue? Which is what county? And you might say to yourself, well, isn't it obvious? All of our cases would be in Cook County if she's here. Um, the Illinois Domestic Violence Act is very lenient about county. You can file where she lives, where he lives, or where the abuse occurred. But if she's going for exclusive possession of the home, if they were both students together at University of Illinois and they had an apartment down in Champaign County and she fled the abuse to come up here with her parents, but she wants to go back, she wants to live in that apartment, then she's got to file in Champaign County. So if you're going for exclusive possession of the home, it makes sense that you would file in the county where the home is located. That's the only exception. Okay, so now we got the right county. What courthouse? Um, we practice in seven courthouses. So there are five suburban courthouses that are listed here, plus there is the domestic violence courthouse at 555 West Harrison. That's whether you're a criminal or civil um, domestic violence case. So we have a lot of cases there. Or if you already have a case pending at the Daly Center, or a divorce case or a parentage case, you might file your order of protection there. So we really, um, Figuring out where the case is filed. It's actually never filed in the U.S. Supreme Court, um, just so <laughs> you're not confused by that. Um, we, don't, we don't go there. We go to seven other courthouses. Um, so the emergency order of protection is ex parte, meaning the other side isn't there. He has no idea we're going into court. He has no advance notice, right? Which is unusual that you would go into court ex parte. But you're doing that in order of protection cases, right, because she's concerned for her safety. Um, so, because the emergency order, which only lasts 21 days, that's a maximum period you can get for an ex parte emergency order of protection, um, there are certain remedies that she cannot get, right? She's not going to get child support, she's not going to get a money remedy or reimbursement for the tires at an emergency order. Um, but she can get all the stay away stuff and she can get exclusive possession of the home. So the biggies she can get in, a, in an emergency order. Um, the emergency order lasts 21 days. Sometimes it's continued. Maybe he wants a continuance, so it'll be continued for another 21 days. And then the plenary order, which is what Illinois calls a permanent order of protection, for the most part, the maximum period is up to two years. There are some exceptions to that, but in general, it's up to two years for a plenary order of protection. 
After we get the order of protection, we got to get, oh, I'm sorry. Is there a maximum for EOC? Is there like a maximum time? A maximum period of time? Well, prior to the respondent being served and having notice, it can only be for 21 days. That is the maximum. Sometimes the respondent might come into court and say, well, I want a continuance, or I have an attorney, and my attorney wants to set a hearing date that's two months out. I mean, sometimes you can agree when the other side has already been served, you can agree to a longer period of time, but maximum is 21 days when it's ex parte. All right, so then we got to get the respondent served. You can get an order of protection with publication, okay? Because we're not always going after him for money. Sometimes we just want the order of protection. Sometimes we just want exclusive possession of the home. All I need is in rem jurisdiction to get those remedies. So if I try personal service over and over and I fail, we can, we can do service by publication to get an order of protection. These are common um, exhibits that we use in these cases. So be mindful of it if you have a client who you think um, is a good referral to our project and who needs an order of protection. She might have photographs. Photographs are fantastic. We love photographs. Medical records, police reports, those are all great. Um, text, Facebook, and voicemail, you know, we see a lot of that. Not so much voicemail, but maybe text and Facebook messages. Um, what do people in the non, that are not in the Children and Family Law Practice Group think that those who practice domestic violence think of uh, social media, Facebook, texting, what would be our opinion of those types of things? Anybody? Where's Kate Gladson? <laughs> Kate, what do we think of that? What do I think of texting and Facebook and Snapchat? Pardon me? I don't know, like, I don't know in what sense you're talking about. In our times, well, in the context of representing somebody in an order of protection against somebody who is allegedly abusive. I mean, it's good evidence of what they were thinking. Yes! <laughs> we love it. We love Facebook and texting because in the old days, like more than 10 years ago, right, he would call on a landline. He would call on a landline, he'd threaten to kill her, and then she'd hang up, and then we'd have to go into court, and she would say, no, I swear, I swear this is what he said. Now he texts it. <laughs> it's so great and he posted on Facebook and I often want to go up after a hearing and thank him for doing that because we get to print it out you know we'll take a screenshot we'll print it we'll take it into court so we love texting we love Facebook um, voicemails are the most fun voicemails. voicemails are fun in court yes they are so these are all good things but the reason that I'm, I'm I'm telling you this is because if you have a client who says to you hey by the way um, I just wanted to tell you I got this horrible text message I think I need legal help he's threatened to do this or that to me I just want you to be mindful to say don't delete you have a text message where he's threatening to kill you, the first words out of your mouth are going to be, don't delete. He leaves a voicemail, he's threatening to kill you, don't delete. Right? He has a Facebook that he might delete, you take a screenshot of that, and you send that screenshot to me, right, before he deletes. So you have to be ready to say that, because that evidence is great evidence, and we need that. What? Don't trash your phone. And, and don't respond in kind. But, yes. okay. <laughs> um, so, why get an order of protection? A lot of people say this. Well, he knows, he, you know, he's not permitted to hit me anyway, so what good is this piece of paper? Why should I get it if it's illegal for him to abuse me? And there's a really great answer to that question that you should all know, which is, if I don't have an order of protection, and I call the police, and the police come to my home, and I say... You know, my husband came, you know, my husband was abusive to me. He was pulling my hair. He was dragging me around the house. And the police come in and, you know, I'm not bleeding and I, I don't have a bruise on my face and there aren't holes in the walls and it doesn't look like things are trashed. There might not be probable cause that a crime occurred. And the police cannot arrest my client, my husband, unless there is probable cause, right? It would be a wrongful arrest. There has to be probable cause before you arrest somebody. Hopefully, there's probable cause. But if I have an order of protection, you know, against Joe Brown at my address, I call 911 and I say, 
My name is Jennifer Payne. I have an order of protection against Joe Brown, and he's ringing my doorbell. And there's Joe with a bouquet of flowers. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants to reconcile, and he's ringing my doorbell. And the police don't take my word for it, right? It's in, it's in, a, it's in a computer tracking system called Leeds. By the time they get to my house, they've confirmed my address and that Jennifer Payne lives there and that I have an order of protection against Joe Brown. And Joe is automatically arrested because Joe has committed the crime of violating an order of protection. And that is a crime. It's a crime to violate the order. So if Joe keeps showing up, ringing my doorbell or knocking on the windows or hiding in the bushes, and I call 911 and Joe keeps getting arrested, that game gets old really quickly. So an order of protection is this incredibly powerful weapon for people who choose to use it, okay? So it, it's very different than not having an order of protection. A criminal order of protection, that is just a term that's used when the civil order of protection is obtained, is conjoined with a criminal case. So if you're arrested for domestic battery, the state's attorney is going to pursue a domestic battery charge against you, and the state's attorney might also get you an order of protection. The same statute, it's still a civil order of protection, it's just conjoined with a criminal case. Just like you could have an order of protection conjoined with a divorce case or conjoined with a parentage case. It just means the person got it in criminal court. That's all it means. It's the same order, it's the same um, effect. The police wouldn't even know if it was obtained in civil court or criminal court. Okay, civil nor contact orders. Um, it's an odd, it's an odd word, it, or, or I think it's an oddly named statute because it doesn't really um, tell you by the name of the statute that it's really for sexual assault and sexual abuse. That's what a civil no contact order is. It's for non-consensual sexual conduct. So um, if you have somebody who was sexually assaulted in some way, you might want to refer that case to us. She might be entitled to a civil no contact order. She does not have to prove that she was in a domestic relationship with somebody. It can be an isolated one-time incident. And in those cases, the only remedies are really just the stay away orders, that he's barred from coming around her, maybe coming around her home, coming around her school. He's, he has to stay away. Um, and the stalking no contact is the same. It's really, the stalking and civil no contact order um, acts came into place because judges were seeing people coming into court. Let's say you had um, somebody who was in college and she sat next to this boy in her class. They never dated. They were not in a domestic relationship. But he's starting to follow her around, right? He's constantly there. He's peeking in her class. We had one case where he came into her classroom and the professor was up front and he turned around and just stared at her the entire class, right? The professor was one of the witnesses. So stalking, monitoring, surveilling you, that's pretty frightening and intimidating even if you're not in a domestic relationship with somebody. So that's, that has to be a course of conduct. An isolated incident for stalking doesn't count. It has to be a repeated act, repeatedly following. Um, civil no contact, it can just be an isolated incident, right? You don't have to be sexually assaulted repeatedly. One time is bad enough. Um, these are just examples of stalking. And then at the end, I put a chart in here so you can have, at a glance, uh, the order of protection and the civil no contact order and the stalking. Any questions? The Address Confidentiality Act, I mean, I'm working with somebody right now to try to get an ID with that. I could use that to get an ID and use a different address so that she's not found. Wait, what do you mean? So, so on her something? identification, she doesn't want to put her actual address. Because oh, on her state ID, she doesn't want to put her address? Well, why does she think he would see her state ID? Oh, I'm just trying to get the connection between her not disclosing to, um, you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles or the Illinois Secretary of State versus her not disclosing her address to somebody who's abusive to her. She feels like he's going to try to find her. He's not around anymore. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it. I mean, I would say I'm not going to advise a client to lie to the Illinois Secretary of State. Right. If she wants a formal state ID. Um, all I was asking is that doesn't provide for a remedy somebody to change an act or put a different address on a state ID. Other, no. other states have that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize yeah. that. No, this just means you don't have to disclose your address on any of the order of protection okay, forms. So just report forms. 
for court forms. Yeah. Unless, did you have another? I, I would have? just be speculating. So. Okay. Um, okay, Benna. All right, so as Jennifer said, I am Benna Crawford, and I'm one of the other supervisors in Children and Families Practice Group, and I am going to talk to you about parenting and support. Okay, so there are multiple ways that you can establish paternity in Illinois. Um, the one that we see a lot of is mom is married, her husband is presumed under law to be the father of the child. His name automatically goes on the birth certificate. There is a presumption, a legal presumption, that he's the father. For unmarried parents, the both parents can sign what's called the Voluntary Acknowledgement of Paternity, where they're both acknowledging that we are the parents of this child, and then both names appear on the birth certificate. You can also have a court order or an adoption contract. One of the things that I want to highlight for all of you is that there's been a, some pretty significant changes in the law when it comes to um, child-related issues, family law issues. The first is the term custody, which I think is the term that we're all really used to hearing. Mom has custody, dad has custody. That is now, that term is gone for the most part. Um, any custody judgments that were entered before January 1st of 2016 are still valid and they're still in effect and those parents have custody. But anything after January 1st, 2016, custody is only used for non-parents. And custody used to include decision-making responsibility for health care, education, and religious. So if... Um, you had custody, you got to make those decisions, either solely or jointly with, your, with the other parent. We used to also have one parent was the primary, had primary residence, and the other parent had visitation. So like I said, joint custody is, it's kind of the ideal world, where the parents have, sp the parents split up, but they are still able to make decisions together for their kids without too much trouble. Um, and you know, they can be a team when it comes to making decisions. So parents who have joint custody, they have to make those major decisions, healthcare, medical, and religious together as a team. Under the old law, parents who have visitation under the old statute, usually the way that that would look is the children live primarily with one parent and the other parent has visitation time. Okay, so the statute changed, as I said, in January of 2016. Custody is now a term that is only applied to these three category, categories of non-parents. So the only people who could have custody of a child under the new statute are grandparents, step-parents, or siblings, adult siblings. Um, it's no longer a term that's applied to parents. Also, same thing with visitation. Visitation is now a term. Parents no longer have visitation with their children. There are the same three categories of people. Grandparents, siblings, and step-parents can have visitation with the children. Um, but it, it is more difficult to get visitation with a child if you are not the parent. So, for example, for grandparents, you have to be able to show usually... There is a presumption that parents know what's best for their children and are making the best choice. So, you know, mom is not letting paternal grandmother visit. There is a presumption that she knows what's best. And grandma has to show that, um, has to overcome that presumption and show that the denial of visitation is causing harm. Okay, so we got rid of custody, and instead we have this fancy new term of parental responsibilities. And the shift from custody to parental responsibilities was really an unbundling of decision-making. 
So before it was an all or nothing. You had either had sole custody and you got to make all those decisions for medical, education, and religious, or you had joint custody. Now it's broken up, decision-making responsibility is broken up into these four categories. So you still have education, healthcare, and religion, but we've added a fourth category of extracurricular activities. And for each of those four areas, you assign a parent the responsibility for making those decisions. So mom and dad could have joint decision-making in all four categories or Mom could do education, dad has health care, they both share religion and extracurricular. You can do it any which way um, that you want or the parents want. So in some ways it gives more flexibility. Um, it's not an all or nothing proposition the way that it was with custody. We also got rid of visitation and instead it's parenting time. There is still going to, you're still going to list a primary residence because you need that for school, which where does the child enroll in school? But there is no, um, there's no visitation. It's just dad has parenting time during this time, mom has parenting time during this time. Does anyone have any questions? Or am I just so clear? Okay. Yes. So how does it work if one parent is the primary sole caretaker and it's one of the situations where, you know, they have to go to the police department or something to do visitation. <coughs> Is that not called visitation anymore? Well, it depends. It could be if that court order was put in place before January 1st, 2016. What would be now? If it was now it would be parenting time. So what the court order would say is that dad has parenting time from this time to this time, and the parents will meet at this police station to exchange the child. Okay. So it's just like a term. Right. It's just a term. It doesn't, we can get into what some restrictions on parenting time would look like in a minute, but it's just a change of term. So what we used to call visitation is now parenting time. So when a court is deciding how to allocate those parental responsibilities, so decision making and parenting time, the court has to look at what is in the best interest of the child. And there are factors that are actually listed in the statute that are also listed here that the court is supposed to consider when deciding what is in the best interest of the child. So the wishes of the parents and the children, the relationship, between the children, the relationship between the child and their other siblings. So if the child has sibling, you know, figuring out parenting time, it's nice to be able to keep siblings together even if they have um, different parents. Um, prior agreements or what have, what have the parties been doing? That can be really persuasive. Um, distance, physical violence, so is there any... Um, domestic violence in the relationship between the parents or directed towards the children. And then the last one is the willingness of the parent to encourage a relationship between the child and the other parent. If, you have, if mom is much more likely to encourage the relationship between the child and its father, she may get more decision making and more parenting time because she's going to make sure that that child has a positive relationship with her father and that might not be the true in the reverse. So going back to what Dana alluded to about restrictions on parenting time, when can a court restrict one parent's parenting time? It's actually a pretty high standard because the time that a parent gets to spend with its chi their child is it's, it's important. And so the court actually has to make a finding that Without these restrictions, there is serious endangerment to the child's physical or mental well-being. I suppose also their moral health. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but if it's in danger, seriously, you well, can get some restrictions. Encouraging a child to commit a crime. Yeah. There we go. Um, and so some of the restrictions can include, um, you know, no parenting time because it's such a danger, maybe there was a really serious physical abuse to the child by one parent, or shorter parenting time. Um, 
supervised parenting time if there are safety concerns, but they don't. That is the most common one that we see if there are some safety concerns, you'll see supervised parenting time. And the supervision can either be done by you know, a third party, a family member, a friend that the client trusts, or there are three, three? In the city. Three supervised visitation centers in the city. Um, that are free. That are free, correct. There are lots if you have money, but for a lot of our clients, we use the, the free ones. There's also, sometimes you have, um, there's not really concern about the children's safety when they're with one parent, but there's a concern about the exchange, right? So mom and dad have to meet up to exchange the children, and that's where the safety concern comes in. And so you can have facilitated exchange either, once again, with a third party that's a friend, or there are also safe exchange locations where the parties can meet at a facility that is designed helps is specifically designed to help with the exchange and the parents don't have to interact. Okay. Another big change in the statute is child support. So this is how we used to calculate child support and it was very simple. It was in the statute. If you have one child, it's 20% of the non-custodial parents net income. Right? It was two children, 28, and it goes up from there up to six. It doesn't matter if you have six or 20 kids, it's 50%. <laughs> At that point, they call it. <laughs> it was really simple to calculate based on this statute. All you needed was you needed to know what is the net income. You needed one of the paychecks of the parent who doesn't have the majority of um, parenting time. And if that person um, was a W-2 wage earner, you could send a notice of income. You, well, you can still do this. You send a notice of income withholding. It comes right out of their check. It gets processed through the state disbursement unit and then dispersed to the client, um, which is a nice way to do it because it, the state disbursement unit will then keep track of the payments, and you don't have a he said, she said situation of what was paid, what was not paid. So this is how you used to calculate child support. As of July 1st of this year, there is um, what's now referred to as the income shares child support formula, which is based on the combined net income of both parents. And there are, if you ever want to just look at this because you have lots of free time, you can go on... <laughs> Um, HFS's website, they, you can do run the calculations, um, which is actually a good thing for you to know if you're ever interacting with a client who's wondering about child support. It is actually a very simple calculation to do on the website. You just plug in some numbers and it calculates it for you. Um, the idea is that each parent pays a share, is responsible for a share of the child related costs based on their income. So for example, let's say mom earns $2,500 a month. This is her gross income. Dad earns $7,500 a month. So they have a combined gross income. I'm sorry, this is actually wrong. It should say the combined gross income because child, or net. It's, it's not. OK, never mind. But you, you can put in the gross in right. the in that calculator, and they which don't, makes it easier for people that's who are right. just wanting to do this. You can just put the gross in, and it'll calculate that right. for you. Right. Um, so, okay, once again, mom has $2,500 a month. Dad has $7,500. So the total household income is 10000 and they have two kids. So there is a table now that was put together by economists that says for a family of with, for a family with the combined net income of $10,000, the cost of raising two kids, what they're going to spend on their two kids is $4,000. And for every different permutation of what the combined income is, there is a number that says this is how much you're going to spend on your kids if this is your income. And then you figure out, so the cost is $4,000. Mom is going to pay 20, her child, her portion of that is 25%. Dad's portion is 75%. And 
And then you don't, they don't need to cut each other checks. You net it out and then there's one check. Do people have questions about that? <laughs> I think I did not do the best job I could have in explaining that. But it tells you if you put the calculator yeah, on here. I will. But if the mom is the primary, like, sorry, I forgot the. She has the majority of parenting yeah. time. Yeah, and she makes more. Does that mean that there's a situation where the you mom could. wouldn't give anything? No, no, no. You could have a situation where moms... So it's no longer tied to if I have the kid, the majority of the time, I get child support. Now, you could have in that situation where mom has the majority of parenting time, but she's actually a much higher wage earner, which means she could be paying some support to dad. You could have that. We don't typically see that for our clients, but you could have that under the new statute. Yes. There is also, so this calculation, there is also, you, the support can be further reduced if the parties are basically splitting their time. So both parents, if you look at an entire year of 365 days, both parents have about 147 nights, overnights. There is a different calculation if that's the case. So all you really need to know is, does the kid spend at least half of his time with both parents? There's a different calculation on the HFS website. Okay, um, yeah, and you know, I, we thought, and I don't know what you guys think, we thought there was gonna be this huge rush of what we would have thought of before as non-custodial parents trying to get more overnights to reduce their child support. I've only really seen that once so far, and I don't know about, I see some shaking of heads. One of right. my cases, only one. So we'll see. There was that concern, but it hasn't played out with the, yes. So does the percentage change or how much the responsibility change with the percentage of parental time you have, or is it all or nothing? It's like you have the minority of the parental time and one calculation, and, and then it suddenly switches. Like, so anyone feel free to jump in, because I'm, you don't have do, so if you, if the parents split Let's say dad, I'm just gonna use dad. So dad has 147 or more overnights with the child. When you're doing the child support calculation, go ahead, Joanne, you look like you're. What the calculator actually increases the amount of support to, to raise that child uh, because both parents are gonna have uh, sort of like doubling the expenses. So instead of the four thousand in the first example, it might be it's six thousand. It might be six, and then you apportion the six based on their incomes. So the idea is that with, if the child is spending half of its time with each parent, that that number of what it costs to raise that child is actually multiplied by one and a half because you have more expenses if the kid is really splitting its time, his time, her time. And it does, when, that, when you do the calculations in that way, it does tend to reduce the amount of support that our clients would get. Okay, so I have included in here the link to the child support calculator. I do think it's a really useful, and, and here's sort of a screenshot. So you can see, it's not hard. You just plug in how many kids do you have the majority of parenting time? And I'm telling you that's 147 overnights. Um, or you can just put in the number of overnights and it'll calculate it for you. It's, it's a really simple questionnaire that you fill out and it'll pop out the number for you of what the child support calculations are. So if you have a client and you're wondering, it's a useful thing to know. Um, and the reason that I'm highlighting this for you is we don't do child support only cases at LAF. That's not going to be, if you send a referral to Jennifer for child support, you know, this client needs child support. If that's the only issue 
LAF doesn't do those cases because the state there's state resources to do those cases. But if you want to be able to just get a sense of what someone might be entitled to or what the calculations would look like, this is a great. Um, you should go to this link and you can um, you can calculate it. You can also the number up here is the number to give people if they want to call and apply for child support services. So if they want to apply for child support, um, and there's also a link on that um, that same website. There's a link to apply online. Yes. Is this connected? I think to the question she was asking before. In when they calculate this, like, because there's a question there about do you have the kid most of the time? If I have the kid eighty percent of the time. Yes. Is there any? Is it does that matter at all in terms of how much support I'm going to owe to the kid, or is it just based on income regardless of who has the kid more? It is just. Well, it depends. If it's if you have the child 80% of the time, then you're going to be, then no, the percentage doesn't matter. It's only when you get into a shared parenting time where it may matter. In other words, if you're the primary residential parent, yeah. if you're the primary residential parent, the calculator is going to favor you as receiving child support. It does. That's, I guess, what I was yes. asking. Yes, okay. it does favor you. And if you have shared parenting time, meaning the non-primary residential parent has 146 days per year or more, mm -hmm. then then you get a reduced amount of child support. Okay. Thank you. And we went to full day trainings on the new calculations, and I, and if anyone's interested, feel free to come stop by my office or Jennifer or Joanne's office. They would love to show you. Especially Joanne would love to show you the new calculus, but and I and I'm happy to do that if anybody wants to. I just didn't want to bore you today with spreadsheets, but I would love to. Uh, also, um, if you go to Aleo's website, you can get the child support calculator through Aleo's website. Which I think is an easy way to get it. All right. <coughs> You're welcome. Hi, I'm Joanne Villasenor. I'm the third supervisor for the family uh, law people and children family. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some divorce basics. Hopefully I can make this work. First of all, um, marriage, which is what you need, obviously, in order to get divorced. Um, in Illinois, it's no longer just a man and a woman. Uh, in 2014, same-sex marriages were recognized and adapted. And the other thing to know for divorce purposes is if you're married in another jurisdiction besides Illinois, and that marriage was legal in that jurisdiction, it's considered a valid marriage here for purposes of divorce. Marriage is a contractual agreement. It's solemnized by a ceremony. It could be either civil or religious. Um, we've had a few cases where people have a what they think is a marriage, and it turns out it may not have been because it didn't fall within the statutory requirements of Illinois law. Uh, but that's few and far between. You do need a valid license, uh, blood test, et cetera. Um, and also, uh, civil unions can now be converted into marriages. I don't think we've seen any, at least that I can think of in our office, but it's, it's out there. For divorce, once you're married and you need to get divorced, uh, one of the big changes is that now in Illinois there's only one possible ground. It used to be you could get divorced based on physical cruelty, mental cruelty, adultery, um, uh, bigamy, but nowadays the only one is irreconcilable differences. The uh, presumption is if you've been separated six months uh, from your spouse, you've met that ground. Um, you do, I mean, it can be separated in the sense that you are living separate and apart in different homes, or sometimes you'll have what we call separated as man and wife, which means you're still in the same house, but you're no longer together. You have to make sure that you explain that to a client when you're going to take their case. <clears throat> you also have to be a resident of the state of Illinois County of Cook for at least 90 days before you file 
or 90 days at the time that you finalize your divorce. Most commonly, I think, uh, at least when I'm doing prove-ups and I think when other people in our uh, practice group are doing prove-ups, we will ask our client, were you a resident of the state of Illinois of County of Cook at the time you filed your divorce and have you maintained that residency up through today? And usually there's going to be at least 90 days, if not longer, between that time. Um, and as I mentioned, fault grounds are gone. So in addition to child support, the other um, financial things that I'm going to talk about, starting with uh, maintenance. The maintenance statute was changed, um, I believe, a couple years ago. It used to be sort of vague. Um, you could get maintenance, the court would listen to all the factors, and maybe you'd get it. But now the statute is pretty clear. 504A, that's 750 ILCS, 504A, lists 14 factors to get maintenance. I myself think the most important ones are the respective incomes of the parties, their standard of living during the marriage, and uh, prospective uh, earning ability. <clears throat> the statute was recently uh, amended. It now says realistic earning expectations. And I think that was meant to cover things like, um, we might have a client who has a college education, but she has not been employed for 20 years in her field of work. So realistically, what's her future earning expectation? Or a woman who's college educated, but is now 55, 58 years old and has not worked for a number of years. So I think that's what that's looking at. Um, the other thing that courts look at, um, it's not really one of the 14 factors, but they certainly look at it, is how long have they been separated? For example, if the parties have only been separated six months, it's reasonable to think that the person seeking maintenance is going to need maintenance. If they've been separated 10 years, the court's going to look at that and say, how have you been supporting yourself? Um, it's, it's a harder case. You do have some judges that will be, much, uh, be pretty liberal about granting maintenance, but when you've got long periods of separation, you have to look into that. You have to, you have to know the answer to that. You have, to, you have to see if you can make the case for maintenance. Uh, the final factor, number 14, is anything else that the court may consider, and I think that's a catch-all that the courts will use. <clears throat> factor number two, after you determine entitlement, is what's the amount? So there's two things to look at. The amount is calculated based on the gross incomes of the parties. It's a formula. 30% of, and I'm just going to use husband for the training purposes, 30% of husband's gross minus 20% of wife's, that's the maintenance amount, but her maintenance amount cannot exceed 40% of the total household income. Um, there's, there's different programs uh, floating around, there's worksheets floating around that you can use to calculate it. It's, it's not too, too hard. One thing to keep in mind, going back to Benna's presentation on child support, when you're doing a child support calculation and the spouse is going to pay maintenance, that maintenance is subtracted from that supporter's income. So it's really important when you're looking at maintenance and child support, especially for clients in our income level, to see how that affects our clients. We do have cases where the maintenance um, is a nice thing to have, but since it's taxable, it might hurt the client tax-wise, whereas child support is not taxable and may be more beneficial to the client. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, the other factor, the other piece of the uh, calculation now is duration. Duration now is also a formula. It's basically uh, for 0 to 5 years of marriage, it's 20% of the total years of marriage, and it's factored at the date of filing the divorce. Um, the other piece of it is, let's say that the parties have been married 10 years. I believe the uh, maintenance amount would be 4.5 years. <clears throat> let's say they file for divorce. She has two years of temporary maintenance. Well, that two years may get subtracted off of the 4.5 years of maintenance. Uh, so that's, 
that's important to know. Before I move on, any questions about maintenance? <clears throat> the other issue in divorces has to do with division of debt and assets. The starting point is that any debt acquired or incurred during the marriage is marital. Any property acquired is marital. There's a few exceptions. And the starting point to divide it is going to be 50-50. Divorce uh, is an equitable proceeding, which means it's meant to be fair to both sides. That's why the starting point is 50-50. There's a couple debts, or at least one debt that occurred to me that's not going to be divided is if one of the spouses has a student loan debt. That will normally be that person's debt after the divorce. Uh, property um, acquired by inheritance. Let's say the husband inherits a house during the marriage. Probably not marital property, although that could be, um, it could become marital property if, um, for example, the party, he, he puts her on title, the parties take out a mortgage, do a big improvement, or there's some other factors that sort of, uh, to use the, the word that I love from law school, transmutate that property um, from non-marital to marital. So uh, another, another item that may not be marital is a personal injury award that stemmed from a pre-marital injury. Although we've, we're looking at a case right now uh, where that's going on, and I think we're doing a little bit of research to just see whether, uh, in fact, that award could be deemed marital. Now. If that personal injury award, uh, let's put it this way, let's say spouse is injured before the marriage. When they get married, the wife takes care of him, nurses him, works, supports the whole family, and then he gets this huge amount of money. Then I'd say you could argue that at least some of that should be marital. But um, as you can see from this, it's, it's always the facts. You always have to know the facts. And you have to know every little bit of the facts um, when you're trying to determine these things. So then what about a spouse who contributes significantly? Pardon? What about a spouse who contributes significantly to the other partner's loans with the understanding that, okay, we'll pay mine off because they're higher and then we'll pay yours? And oh, like to student loan debt? I don't know. You'd have to, you'd have to really look at that. I mean, off the top of my head, student loan debts are personal to that person. But I suppose if you had a situation where the one spouse's loans were completely paid off, then maybe you could argue that the other side should, should bear some responsibility. Um, not too long ago, uh, one of the other attorneys here had a case where the spouse supposedly paid all of the husband's, I think they were premarital credit card debt. And so we're trying to figure out whether she can be compensated for that. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about a pretty important issue that comes up in our divorce cases. Remember how I said that anything acquired during the marriage is marital property? So a very big piece of that can be a retirement account. There's any, anything, any part of a retirement account that accrued or grew, or grew during a marriage is marital. And that includes, even if the person had a pension from before the marriage, and then continued to work in that industry or continued to earn that pension during the marriage. Um, there's two different, well, actually three different types of uh, pension benefits. And I don't know if anybody here has ever dealt with pension benefits or knows anything about them. Um, defined benefit is the type of pension we think of where you retire and you get a monthly amount every month. Uh, defined benefits, you don't see too many of those plans anymore. Firefighters, police officers, municipal workers, uh, other federal government workers have that type of plan. You do still see some private industry that have pensions. Um, the second type is what's called a defined compensation, and that's the kind that we know of more, uh, we're more familiar with, a 401k. Anyone here who's in the union, there's a 403b plan, which is a, it's similar to a 401k, 
It's just 403B because we're a not-for-profit, and 401Ks are for for-profit industries. There's other uh, somewhat more rare pensions, post office, military, uh, railroad pensions. Railroad pensions act like Social Security benefits, except that there's a piece of the railroad benefit that can be divided in a divorce. And even though I didn't put this in my material, Social Security benefits are a form of retirement benefit, but they are also not divisible or apportioned in the divorce judgment itself. So it's important when you're looking at a case to see, is there a retirement account? And the way you can find it out is, who's the person employed by? Are they in a union? Look at the pay stub. Pay stubs have a wealth of information. Um, unfortunately, people don't really get pay stubs per se anymore since everybody's paid uh, online, but um, the W-2s from their, from their taxes, the W-2 box 12 and box 13 are really important uh, things to look at, and I included some of that in here. So that's a W-2. That's a W if you look, box 12, that's a, always look at these. There's all kinds of information you can get. Box 13, if this box is checked, they have a retirement plan. So it's really, really, really helpful, I think, to get that and look at it. Um, box 12 has all kinds of information of different uh, refer, uh, deferrals. If you see box 12E, elective deferrals 403B, that can be divided. D, 401K. That's another type of, of elective uh, deferrals. All those things can be divided in a divorce, so it's important to know about them. I'm just going to kind of skip. But anyway, so I just put that in there because obviously I find this stuff fascinating, <laughs> and I think it's important to know about it too. All right. The uh, other big piece of property in a divorce is the marital property. Generally... Uh, we look at what's called the value of the house, net value. The uh, property uh, value at large, like what it would sell for, minus the mortgage or mortgages, that's the net value. That's the value of that property for divorce purposes. Um, we also want to look at who's living there. Our clients living there with the kids? Okay, fine. Can she pay the mortgage? She might have to get it refinanced to take the husband's name off. Maybe he's living in the house. So if he's living in the house, how about selling it and giving her her half? Or he can keep it and buy her out. So, there's, so you need to know that stuff. If the mortgage is not current, then might have other problems. Might have a foreclosure problem that we have to uh, consolidate into the divorce. Um, are anybody from the housing or from the uh, consumer practice group, they've all been super helpful in our divorce cases where we've had to consolidate and figure out what's going on with the mortgage. Um, the other kind of simple question, does our client want the house? Um, I'm, I've had clients who want to keep the house, but they really have no way to pay the mortgage. And other clients that are ready to walk away, and it's like, okay, but there's like 50000 in equity. Don't, don't you want half of that? So it's important to be able to tell clients 